Hello, uh, my name is Linda Gale Becker from the Desmond Tutu HIV Centre and I thank Quasi and the organising committee for this opportunity. We are 40 years on in the HIV epidemic and there is no doubt we missed some significant uh, prevention goals. Too many countries have failed to put in place the combination of structural, behavioural and biomedical approaches to HIV prevention. And of course, COVID-19 has set us further back in the last two years. So almost 2 million new infections occurred in 2020, threefold higher than expected. And this is despite a fairly um, amazing array of primary prevention options available to us. Today, I'll be recounting the history and looking at the immediate future of uh, ARV-based prevention, namely PrEP, PEP and microbicide, and quickly also reviewing direct, um, active and passive immunization. In the last 10 years, I think it can be said we've had a prevention innovation revolution, particularly around um, ARV-based prevention. Sadly, implementation has not been quite as uh, impressive and Sinead will happily be um, expanding on that during this session. So let's turn first to pre-exposure prophylaxis. It's almost a decade now that we've known that a single pill a day can prevent HIV. And it was these uh, very important studies, uh, namely Partners PrEP TDF2, uh, the Bangkok uh, and IPREX, that showed that when adherence is high, HIV protection is consistent and high. Fempres, FEMPREP and VOICE confirming that adherence to that daily regimen is really important. The agent uh, in question was a combination of tenofovir and emtricitabine, both nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors. And we had these results in 2010 with FDA approval in 2012 um, and the first WHO guidance in 2015. And today, over 2 million people have accessed this prevention, and it is definitely beginning to have an impact in those areas where scale up has, has been significant. Even for the individuals, it has changed lives. And so certainly this is, I think, the bedrock of primary prevention. However, research and development goes on. And the first uh, question after the daily regimen was, could this be taken on demand? And we thank our French colleagues for this. A study called IPAGAY run by the ANRS showed that indeed a 211 regimen two tablets taken two to 24 hours before sex, a single tablet 24 hours after the first two, uh, and another tablet after that was non-inferior to the daily regimen. And when men are offered the opportunity of one or the other choice of uh, regimen, um, it is about a 50-50 uh, choice. So this is now recommended by the WHO to all men, uh, regardless of uh, who they have sex with. The next development was to say, could other ARV agents be used? And here the close cousin of tenofovir is tenofovir alafenamide. Uh, it has better PK, is better tolerated with fewer side effects. Um, although it must be said that oral FTDF is also well tolerated um, and certainly better priced. Uh, but for older uh, users and people with bone or renal, implications, it, I think it is encouraging to know that in a study called DISCOVER, um, DISCOVI or FTAF was shown to be non-inferior to FTDF. This did not include women, and so we do not yet have this as a, uh, an option for women, although I will return to that in a moment. We do, however, know that a daily regimen is not feasible for everyone. There are issues of discretion, issues of forgetfulness, uh, and other issues that lead to less uptake and less persistence with the daily regimen. And so, similar to the contraceptive world, it has been necessary to ask, can we come up with less frequent and alternative dosing strategies? In other words, longer acting agents. And we know how important this has been in the contraceptive and other fields of medicine when it comes to persistence and better adherence. 
So the first of these is the depivirine ring. A non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor depivirine is infused into a vaginal ring, which can be inserted for one to three months in young women and older women uh, to prevent HIV. And two studies, one called Aspire, the other called the Ring Study, showed a round about 30% reduction in HIV acquisition in Africa uh, due to, um, again, uh, very closely linked to adherence to the ring, uh, keeping the ring in place for as long as possible uh, during that month for uh, its effectiveness. That effectiveness was improved once the studies moved into the open label phase, showing a risk reduction of 0.5 in the open label, leading to the EMA granting approval under Section 58, and the WHO now recommending this for women in low and middle income countries as a second line to oral PrEP. We will see how this plays out in terms of the science of choice. Uh, we have recently concluded an interesting study called REACH or MTN034, which showed very nicely that women are able to make a choice uh, and that when given that choice, in fact, uptake and persistence are both improved. The next question is, can we offer uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis as a long-acting suspension for delivery via intramuscular injection. And the first agent up here is a strand transfer integrase inhibitor known as cabotegravir. In its long acting form, it has an incredibly long half-life allowing a single injection to be given every eight weeks. And the first study to show that indeed, uh, CABLA has superiority over daily oral FTDF was HPTN083 run in cisgender men and transgender women. Uh, very exciting results there that actually were upped for the first time in women in Africa and uh, led wonderfully by Sinead, the HPTN084 study showing final results that were actually were uh, better than what we'd seen in the men's study, uh, a magnificent 89% reduction of HIV infection compared to the FTDF arm. So both these studies having uh, started after uh, the introduction of oral TDF did not have placebo uh, they had active comparators, so double dummy, double uh, blind studies for both. Important, though, to note that although we'd had a somewhat um, difficult pass with oral TDF in clinical trials in African women, in HPTN084, the pooled HIV incidence across both arms was significantly lower than we would expect uh, in the background incidence. So really both arms showing effectiveness for women in that study. So now offering to young women in Africa, the choice of oral PrEP, the vaginal ring and cab -Alay. I think it is gonna be very exciting to see how this plays out. And we know that cab is in front of at least six uh, other regulators besides the FDA who have now approved cab in America, and uh, the EMA has similarly done so. Is Latrovia is in the pipeline. So I've concluded the efficacy trials that have had a readout where we know where we are. Uh, is Latrovia is still in the field and under development. This is a very exciting agent, a new class of agent, a novel mechanism. It's a nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor and incredibly potent, as you see uh, from the PK in the phase twos, a very long half-life, allowing for a monthly administration of this very small pill. And these have now moved into uh, two large phase three studies known as Empower 022 and 024 among cisgender women on the one hand with an FTDF comparator arm and men and transgender women who have sex with men with an FTDF or an FTAF uh, comparator arm. Here you see the study schema for both studies, a one-to-one -one randomization amongst 4,500 women uh, and a two-to-one randomization amongst 1,500 men. Both studies having a sentinel uh, cohort for background incidents uh, using recency assays. 
Unfortunately, both these studies are currently on clinical hold as of uh, the early part of this year. This followed um, not a clinical but laboratory adverse events involving lymphocyte count, which led to the DSMB pausing the study uh, and then later the FDA placing both of these studies on clinical hold. And the developers are now looking hard and quickly for a mechanism of action, also ensuring that there is return to normality and following up those individuals who are already enrolled in the clinical trial. Because of its potency, because of its um, strategy, its uh, mechanism of action, is Latravir is also very favorable for long acting implants. And we know that this work was underway. Uh, we had certainly seen the initial very exciting clinical uh, readouts for this implant. It is using the contraceptive implanon um, implant mechanism. Uh, but again, unfortunately, because it appears to be the drug that is uh, the, the problem here, uh, this work is also on clinical hold uh, for now. There are other implants underway, namely uh, TAF implants and Cabotegravir reservoir implants, and we should watch this space in the future. The third agent uh, to, that is very exciting and for consideration is a new agent, Lenacapavir. It is a capsid inhibitor, and again, very favorable PK with the need for only one injection every six months. Um, we have quickly moved this into phase three. And here you see that the schema for the adolescent girls and young women study, uh, a two to two to one reg, uh, randomization of Lenacapavir to FTAF. So we'll be able to see whether FTAF has um, a, how its endpoint is vis-a-vis -vis the standard of care FTDF uh, daily oral prep. Um, so two primary endpoints here. Again, this uh, schema involves a cross-sectional cohort to estimate background HIV incidence. And so two primary endpoints, Lenacapavir versus background and FTAF versus background. And this study is being conducted in South Africa and Uganda and involving pregnant and breastfeeding women. Sadly, this study is also on hold, not because of the agent here, but because of the vial uh, in which the agent has been placed. So uh, may or may not know that there is a worldwide shortage of glass vials following COVID-19 vaccination efforts. Um, and the particular vial in which the lenacapavir has been placed for the clinical trial is showing some microparticles. Uh, for this reason, the study uh, is not uh, involving any more in, uh, injection of lenacapavir whilst the vials are being sorted out. And we hope that that will be very soon. Uh, this is how the main study looks involving 3000 men, again, a background HIV incident cohort um, with the primary endpoint of Lenacapavir versus uh, FTDF uh, being studied in the Americas and in South Africa um, in a large group of cisgender, trans, cisgender men, transgender women, transgender men and gender non-binary individuals um, in that study. Similarly, the vial issue leading to uh, a temporary uh, paused enrollment. Let's move quickly to post-exposure prophylaxis. We, this is a good old friend. We've known PEP for a very long time. In fact, since the discovery of Zydovudine, this has been used for occupational post-exposure prophylaxis, sexual assault uh, in the field of prevention of mother to child and unintended exposure of a sexual nature or Pepsi. What has changed in the PEP world? Well, of course, now it really is being promulgated as something we should think about uh, in every case, because really the drugs are far more tolerable, uh, safer to take. A third drug is routinely added. We've swapped out Zydovudine for Tenofovir and replaced the PIs uh, with in, 
uh, integrase inhibitors. We don't necessarily recommend a starter pack. The time of starting is remains critical as soon as possible after exposure within 72 hours and still with the 28 day follow up. Um, it is unlikely we will be seeing any more studies, very difficult to do PEP studies, but we did see some new data coming out of CROI uh, amongst non-human primates, uh, looking firstly at weekly oral isolatravir, um, looking at two versus three drug, drug regimens with the single drug um, BIC FTC TAF um, regimen, uh, and then on-demand HIV post-exposure prophylaxis using TAF and Altegrava vaginal inserts. Another uh, exciting study by the UK group showing the value of a five-day starter pack of PEP being taken home by people to try to reduce the time to starting PEP. In other words, not the starter pack post-exposure, but a starter pack which is prophylactically kept at home uh, certainly seemed to make a difference in that time to starting PEP. So do look at that. That time to starting PEP is also important for occupational health. And here I want to give a shout out for Dr. Oosthuizen from Tigerberg Hospital, which has put together a very practical um, self-help box, which sits in the emergency unit and helps uh, particularly young healthcare workers who may uh, be exposed um, and need to access PEP at any time. It is not only the time to starting, but it's also persistence with the 28 day regimen. And we know that people struggle with this, particularly in the setting of sexual assault. And I draw your attention to this study out of Uganda, which I think really calls into question still more research needed around helping people um, uh, comply with that 28 days. Okay, turning to HIV vaccines. Uh, and here, of course, we do want to say that there is still very much a role for vaccines in the setting of ARV-based prevention. We know that there are all kinds of benefits to vaccination, um, including the potential for herd immunity down the pike. Now, to date, we have in looking for uh, active vaccination strategies, we've used both an empirical or inductive approach where promising candidates are tested in the field um, and then correlates are identified vis-a-vis -vis the theoretical or deductive approach. Having had less than successful attempts in the first approach, the world is now moving much more into the more deductive approach uh, where we determine immune correlates of protection and then design immunogens to induce those immune correlates. And I'll come back to that in a little bit of time. But let me start with the last of the uh, or the first and the last of the exciting uh, sort of empirical approaches was RV144. This was the Thai study using a combination of LVAC with the AIDS vax um, envelope protein uh, strategy. Um, and here we saw a 61% reduction in HIV at the end of uh, 12 months. But at the end of the study, only a 31% uh, reduction, which was not thought to be significant to be able to move this particular regimen into commercialization. But it certainly did unleash a correlates of protection um, investigation. We were able to identify, surprisingly, um, a neutralizing uh, non broad broadly neutralizing antibody in the V1, V2 loop, which was thought to be significant. And this led to the P5 program. Uh, the P5 program said, let's take the RV144 regimen, improve on it, uh, make it clade C specific, change the adjuvant uh, to um, try and enhance both um, the level of protection and its durability. That was taken forward in the Uhumbo study or HVTN702. Uh, and we have 
during the last couple of years seen that study unfortunately come to a halt due to futility, as you can see in the results now published, that HVTN 702 based on RV144 did not show any uh, efficacy at all. The second major efficacy trial was based on the J&J vaccine research program. That is, this is involving the AD26 mosaic and MVA mosaic together with a GP140 regimen. The woman study shown here with four doses of vaccination um, in uh, the at months zero and three, and then at six and twelve, involving uh, these on on an AD twenty six background, as you see, the study involving two thousand six hundred women with a first phase and a second phase and certain criteria needing to be met for the second phase. Unfortunately, in May of this year, the DSMB, uh, in May of last year, the DSMB met um, and decreed that, in fact, vaccine effectiveness was insignificant um, and that did not allow uh, the study to move into the second phase. So vaccine effectiveness per protocol was not different from zero, despite the fact that the vaccine was well tolerated and safe, uh, Imbacordo uh, did not show any efficacy. There is a uh, correlate study ongoing, and we hope that we will learn a lot from this study. Um, but sadly, that has come to an end. The brother study, Mosaico, however, is still in the field and enrolling. Uh, it involves a heterologous prime boost regimen, again, on the backbone of AD26, with a bivalent uh, mosaic clade C GP140 and is being studied in MSM and transgender in the Americas and Europe. And here you see the schema for Mosaico. Um, and we are excited to see how that study will end up. Uh, just to note, all the although there is a placebo arm here, all the individuals in the study are being offered uh, oral uh, prep as and when they uh, wish to use it. Speaking of prep and vaccines, this very exciting study is also now in the field. This is a three-arm, two-stage uh, vaccine and prep study. Uh, involving FTDF, FTAF, and um, the DNA envelope GP140, uh, MVA, um, and GP120 vaccines. As you see, multi-arm, multi-stage, uh, exciting study, and we look forward to seeing how that rolls out uh, in the next little while. So sadly, both Uhambo and Imbacordo no longer in the field. Uh, we do have Mosaico and Prepback. Mosaico hopefully reading out in 2023 and Prepback in 2024. Let's move to the theoretical or deductive approaches. And here you see the effort here is to elicit broadly neutralizing antibodies. Um, this is involving a number of engineered vaccine designs, including germline targeting approaches um, and some very exciting new uh, immunogens coming forward through this work. We've seen the early clinical trials, um, and this effort is really to see if we can train the immune system to develop a, a number of mature broadly neutralizing antibodies by boosting it significantly over time and encouraging the uh, immune system to develop these important broadly neutralizing antibodies. HIV approaches were used to find COVID vaccines, and of course that has been incredibly significant, but it is also important to say that COVID-19 vaccines have given impetus to HIV solutions. And here we see the first of the mRNA HIV vaccines coming out. Um, very exciting. mRNA vaccines, of course, is a way uh, to get the immunogen using a lipid nanoparticle coat. Um, and there are at least five mRNA vaccines in two trials uh, testing different strategies. Here you see them listed. 
um, and at least another five to 10 mRNAs entering the clinic in the next 12 to 18 months. So very exciting work there. In the last minute, I'm going to say something about broadly neutralizing antibodies. Of course, this is passive transfer of immunization using monoclonal antibodies, again, highlighted during the COVID-19 era. Here we see the readout of the first of these VRCO1, um, and this study known as AMP, run both uh, in men who have sex with men, uh, transgender women and women who have sex with men, shown to have, uh, to prove the concept that this can work, but in itself not efficacious. And the reason for th this was that we have found that the in vitro viral susceptibility to VRCO1 predicted prevention efficacy. And it was only effective against viruses measured to be neutralization sensitive. Only 30% of circulating strains in the control group were susceptible in vivo to the antibody, giving the study lower power to detect overall efficacy. So hope here, but we need to go back to the drawing board to think about our neutralizing antibodies. And of course, there are a number of targets on HIV-1 for these, uh, these very important broadly neutralizing antibodies. We've been able to discover a slew of new uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies, as I say, VRCO1 being the first of many. And here you see them beautifully laid out in this diagram put together by AVAC, uh, covering a large array of parts of the envelope protein having differing breadth and potency, again, very nicely laid out as to where these exciting antibodies fit. And these are now moving into clinical trials. So we have broadly neutralizing antibodies um, moving into a range of clinical trials. So where are we in active immunization? As you can see, again, somewhat of a uh, sad, um, outcome for some of our clinical trials, um, but exciting that RV144 remains uh, some sense of hope. The AMP trial is there. Uh, we still have uh, 706 in the field and PrepVac uh, coming down the pike. So the pipeline is looking good with uh, work being done on non-neutralizing uh, immune responses, uh, broad T cell responses, the viral vectors I've not mentioned, also very exciting, particularly CMV, and then uh, this new field of the broadly neutralizing antibodies, particularly on the back of mRNA. So let me conclude by saying we do have uh, an exciting lineup of uh, PrEP, PEP, and uh, monoclonal antibodies, and we hope that that vaccine is coming up uh, in the in the in the background. With that, I thank many people over many years, and of course the many wonderful communities and participants who've brought us this far. Thank you.